Hey guys, it's Maggie and I am back today with a little bit of a different subject matter. I know we've been on the adenomyosis kick for a few days because that's the, the new and happening thing over here. Today we're going to be talking about a subject that I would have loved to have heard about when I was around 14 years old and I am hoping that the parents out there that are worried about this and also the young people out there that are worried about this, hopefully this gives you a little bit of comfort. So let's get into it. As you can tell, there is a giant sore on my lip. I I don't know. Long story, I got one of my little allergy attacks, was blowing my nose over and over again, so my lip got really raw and sore, and then I had to go to my appointment in which I wore a mask for like an hour and a half. My mask felt like very humid that day, I think. I think that's how I got this guy. I thought it was shingles for like half a second and then it, it doesn't feel like shingles because I've had shingles before and I think I'm okay. Anyway guys, today I'm going to be talking about puberty and delayed puberty with IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, all of that stuff. I obviously will only be able to share my own personal perspective as a female growing up with IBD, but this goes across the board to both males and females, so I want you to know that this video isn't just for females. I know that there are young people with IBD questioning what the heck is going on with their body and why it's not doing what every other kid's body is doing and I know that there are also parents out there that are thinking that too because myself and my dad have been in that position. So I will be talking just a little tiny bit of the science behind it. I'm really not going to go into too much detail because over my head, but I will be sharing some articles in the description box on YouTube. So if you click on that, you'll be able to see some scientific articles, some, some studies with it to basically back up what I am attempting to say. So there are a few different factors when it comes to growing up with IBD and it relating to delayed growth, delayed puberty. And the first one is probably pretty obvious to you. When you've got a GI disorder as a young person, when you're supposed to be growing and you're not able to take in the nutrients that you're supposed to be, all of the calories you're supposed to be taking in, you're not going to grow. And that's kind of the first reason why people with IBD are experiencing delayed growth, delayed puberty. When a young child or a child gets diagnosed with IBD, it usually takes a while, or at least from what I've seen, because a lot of the times people are labeled as picky eaters or just kind of fussy or maybe they're complaining too much like, yeah, okay, you have a stomach ache, sure. It took me four years to get an IBD diagnosis. I was told to drink more milk, to eat more for four years until I started bleeding <laughs> and I plateaued on the growth chart. Clearly something was up and they finally took me seriously. Well, they took my parents seriously because I, I didn't know what was going on. Also, even when you're able to eat and take in your food and nutrients, it doesn't mean that it's going to absorb. So you could be eating all of that stuff and it's going right through you because you have IBD, you have inflammation in your intestines, and that makes it difficult for you to absorb anything out of the food. So it's kind of just in one end and out the other. Also, the cytokines that are involved with the inflammatory process in our body, including the tumor necrosis factor, which you may or may not heard of, it's very, um, very popular with our disease because a lot of the medications that we take for IBD block tumor necrosis factor and that's why it works against inflammation. So these cytokines may have some involvement with growth delay as well. 
And one of the last things I'll mention that may have something to do with IBD and the delayed growth is steroids. They are the first thing that almost every patient is treated with, and that's because steroids are great for getting rid of inflammation fast and getting you into remission. But the whole point is that that's kind of our first line of medication, and then we transition over to a more long-term maintenance medication like a biologic, like the Humira, Remicade, whatever it might be, depending on your severity of disease. But there are some people who really struggle to come off of steroids, and that can relate to a whole slew of complications. When you look up long-term steroid use and the side effects it can have on your body, they're they're pretty hardcore. They can cause a lot with your hormones and your bones, but one thing they can also do if you're using it long term is delayed growth. So that's why your doctor may be pushing you to, to get off of it as quickly as possible and to get onto another medication. Because all of this is happening during your prime time for growing, this is when you know your body is supposed to take off and do all these crazy things and now you have this disease that says, <laughs> hold on a second, I'm gonna go screw this up. That's why doctors can sometimes be pretty aggressive with treating IBD. Like for instance, you may not see, and this is not saying that this never happens, but you don't see a ton of adults with inflammatory bowel disease specifically using a feeding tube. Like I said, I'm not saying that's impossible. There are people who need it because their disease is so severe that they are not able to maintain their weight. But as a child, you're not only trying to maintain your weight, you're trying to grow. So that's why you will see a lot of kids, especially, I, I mean, I feel like I always saw them around the age of maybe 10 to 14 using a feeding tube because you're just trying to keep on pace and be able to grow like you're supposed to by using the nutrition that the feeding tube formulas give you. Which I know from personal experience, if you are a young person who might be facing that, um, I have been there. I was there as, I think I was 11 and 12 facing feeding tubes and it's scary. Um, it seems like you will not be able to do it, but I promise you, you will. You will be able to do it. And those were some of my favorite patients to work with in the hospital because, you know, not every, I, I had some friends who were very brave <laughs> that, you know, put a feeding tube down their nose because they wanted to know what their patients were feeling, but most nurses don't know what it feels like. So it's really special when you can go into a room and tell them, okay, this is exactly what you're gonna feel as the tube goes down. This is when you wanna swallow. This is when you wanna take a sip of water. Here are the tricks that work to help it go down nice and smooth. So yes, but if your doctor is really pushing you, and this is to parents too who might be hesitant, um, there's a reason why. There's a reason why doctors are pushing. It's because this can not just affect this moment in time or these few months in time. This can affect you for the rest of your life. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what I experienced with delayed growth and delayed puberty because this is huge um, and this is really what I wanted to focus on for this video because I haven't seen a lot of people talk about it um, I guess as an adult. And this is also part of the message that I want to share with young adults as well as parents is that um, as a child, I mainly just had my father, my mother passed away around the same time that I was diagnosed. And, you know, that's difficult for a daughter to be able to talk to her father and tell them all of the symptoms going on. And I was really struggling because I, from the age of like 11 to the age of 14, weighed 65 pounds. And I looked like a skeleton, as you can imagine. I was very, very sick. I was experiencing almost spasmy cramping, and I also had severe constipation and had the awful, awful effect of anal leakage. And who wants to tell their dad that? Like, who wants to experience that as a 14-year-old? That's That sucks. So this went on for a very long time until I, I couldn't take it. I was hiding food under our couch and napkins because 
I was getting pressure from both my dad and my doctor to just eat more, eat more, eat more, but I, I literally couldn't. I would try some days and man, I ruined the carpet in my bedroom because I vomited so much one time. It We had to pull the carpet up and change it because I just threw up so much. My dad was like, okay, something's wrong here. But it got to a point, I remember before school one day, I said, dad, th this is what's happening. I cannot take it anymore. And before we could even get me into a doctor's appointment, I wound up in the ER. And this is where they found I had my anal stricture, basically that super narrow, super scar tissued portion of my rectum, which meant that I could not go to the bathroom and I had truly not gone to the bathroom fully in months. Months. Now mind you, I am I was probably about 14. I was a freshman in high school when this all occurred and my period was nowhere in sight. I had not even danced around puberty. I didn't, it, it was not anywhere near for me. And I saw all of my friends going through it and they were changing and I was just sitting still, sitting still, not doing anything. My surgeon finds the stricture and he dilates it or he opens it back up and I'm finally able to go to the bathroom for the first time in what felt like forever. And it was the first time I could eat and feel good. So I kept thinking to myself, if I just told somebody what I'm experiencing or if somebody had caught it, that's a whole other story. As a GI doctor, I think probably should have caught a blockage, but whatever. But if I had been more vocal about what I was experiencing, I could have experienced that relief way earlier and I don't know where I'd be today. But this allowed me to finally start gaining weight and I will say I'm now 27. I was 14, 15 at the time. So it's been 12, 12 13 years since that and it hasn't been an easy road as some of you have seen over the last few years. But discovering that really changed the course of things for me. And around 15, I think I was almost 16, I finally, finally got my first period. I was in art class and I went to the bathroom and you know, a lot of girls I think are maybe scared, freaked out. I was cheering. I was like, woohoo! But yes, I finally got it. And I knew that, you know, all the hard work that I put in opening up to my dad and just being very honest about what I was experiencing. And I think he learned a lot from it too, to really dive deep into, okay, how are you really feeling? <laughs> okay, I know you're good, but how are you really feeling? That helped me to basically always vocalize what I'm experiencing. And now my dad knows all of my symptoms. He knows about my weird periods that I've had. He knows pretty much, pretty much all of the embarrassing things that you probably wouldn't want to tell your dad. We talk about openly because we learn that when we don't have those open discussions, it doesn't lead to good things. And to put this into perspective for you so you can kind of understand where I am physically and the effect that that may have had on me for the rest of my life and um, why you should really take your IVD seriously. I know that there are young people that might be watching this and it is a difficult journey to be going through as a young person, but this is your battle and this is your journey and you will be able to overcome the things that you think you can't. So please, please keep that in mind. And parents, you too. But to give you where I'm at, I probably stopped growing height-wise around 12, and I made it to five foot, maybe half an inch, and I told you I weighed around 65 pounds. Here I am at the age of 27 years, years later, and I weigh 95, 96 pounds, and I'm still about five feet tall. So I am not a huge tall person, but I probably wasn't ever going to be because my mom was 5'2". She had a bit more weight to her than I do, but the females um, and even some of the males on my mom's side of the family are shorter. So <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very fortunate that I was able to get to the height that I did when I did 
and um, now I don't have a problem with maintaining my weight. I'm very fortunate for that. I don't do tube feedings anymore. I don't do any of that. I'm on Humira. I just started that a few weeks ago though, and I'm doing well. So I, I just felt like I wanted to share a little bit of my story with the delayed puberty because I've been talking more about women's health recently, and I feel like this sort of falls into that category because that was my experience early on, and I know that I felt so alone. <laughs> there was nobody else going through this with me at the time, and um, it really just helped to share what was happening with me, and it helped me advocate for myself. So when I go to the doctors now, they hear it all. I mean, I share the embarrassing details. I go through it all because you never know what way that might help you or improve the way you're living. And parents, I know that talking to your child about puberty might be hard or or their bowel movements or, you know, all, all the IBD lovely issues we may experience, but try to approach your child with IBD and, and just make sure that you have as good an understanding of what they're going through as possible. Hopefully this can help you both on the road to better treatment for them. IBD as a child, as a teenager, that's not fun. It's not a fun thing to go through when you're already going through a lot as it is, just as a normal kid. So please know it does get better. It does improve. Yeah, let me know if you have a story similar to mine. Let me know in the comments below because I know a lot of people do get diagnosed with IBD later in their lives, but I, especially working at um, the children's hospital that I worked at, we saw very young IBD cases. I think my youngest, I think I had a two month old that was diagnosed with very early onset IBD, that's what it's called. So let me know if you have any experiences growing up with IBD and you know, going through puberty with this because it is an experience and uh, hopefully any parents or teens that might be going through this can see those stories below and know that they are not alone in this and that there is light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> All right, I hope that you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next. Bye.